traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe nations, the lands which are covered by the dish with one steam wall and belt of green. As we come together on this research day, we should recognize deep history and the enduring presence of these indigenous peoples who have nurtured and protected this land for thousands of years. The principle of the wall and belt reminds us of the importance of sharing knowledge and resources responsibly and sustainably. These are ideas that resonate deeply with our own mission for research and education. So, they reflect today in our own scholarly practices and the conversations we have about our own research endeavors should be guided by values of respect, justice, and right action. This is a celebratory day, or at least that's the way I think of it, because here we are at Nerd Day. And the history of our Norman Education Research Day is one that we came up with recognition for um, a member of our community who has served and had a significant influence on this scope and shape of health professions education scholarship in Canada and globally. Dr. Jeff Miller. But there's a rich uh, sense of joy when we put together the acronym post hoc when a number of us on Twitter, which was called, so called Twitter then, realized that with all good intention, we came up with Norman Education Research Day, and it perfectly encapsulates who we are. We are all a bunch of nerds. So here you are amongst friends, an opportunity to share your own work, an opportunity hopefully to have some additional conversations, an opportunity to be sustained and renewed in your own commitment to education and education scholarship. A few housekeeping details before we get to meet Dr. Seabock Sire, who is really who you're hearing here about. First, we'd love to hear feedback. We change the course and the content of our uh, day uh, each year based on the feedback that you have. So you can find us at normanresearchday.ca. There are QR codes out front that will remind you where to go and also how to give us feedback. But we'll also hear from you on X, if that's still a thing. All you need to do is tag us with nerd2024. And ideally, at Merrick underscore McMaster or at McMaster HSED. We'll find that and for your contribution there is sway coming your way. So we want to motivate you to participate in that way. After our keynote presentation, there are going to be a number of oral presentations. We invite you to participate. All details are again available on the web, found through the QR code or on some of the papers uh, signage we have. And then at lunch we have an extended period for post reviewing. And we also have a, a number of vendors here, so we welcome the Center for Simulation-Based Learning. We'd also welcome the Clinician Educator Diploma, and we'd also welcome the Program for Interprofessional Practice and Education Resources. And so go and talk to other communities that may be part of your community or may be new to you in a way to contribute and to connect. I have one, uh, two tasks for you today. You're here probably with a number of motivations, but I ask you to be thoughtful about considering this. Why don't they make a single new connection today? Someone that you've heard about, or someone that serendipitously you bump into. Those are the connections that will sustain you and sustain us as a community engaged in education scholarship. And the second is, think about one new idea, something that excites you, something that stimulates perhaps from our plenary, perhaps from your conversation, perhaps from the posters that you use. If you can leave here with a new connection and a new idea, I think that's a major win for you and a win for all of us. Without further ado, let me introduce our plenary speaker, Dr. Stephanie Seabox Sire. Dr. Seabox Sire is an assistant professor at Stanford, but don't worry, she has lots of uh, uh, maple syrup in her blood. She did PhD training at Queen's in measurement, assessment, and, and evaluation and subsequently a postdoctorate fellowship at, the, uh, at Western University. She's been described as methodologically nimble, which I think is just another way for being completely awesome. But her scope of uh, ideas and her scope of methodologies that attempt to answer her various research questions are quite diverse. You're going to discover that in her talk today. I had a bit of a preview already, and I'm already, my hair is blown back with pretty excited. <laughs> She would describe her research and her program of research, research under three broad domains, which probably don't give a full assessment of the depth of her thinking and where she's moving our field. But briefly, she thinks about the psychometric aspects of performance-based assessments. She's interested in the interdependence that exists within teams. 
and she's trying to develop innovative approaches using the electronic health record data to support a shift in competency-based education. Without further ado, Dr. Seabock Sire. Okay. 
context of medical education, neither of these approaches is sufficient. And we've spent a lot of time, myself and my teams, really looking at what we have now theorized as the interdependence and really trying to understand what that was like in our teams. And so how I approached doing this was I went back and I was like, okay, if we want to know what's happening in the clinical environment, we want to know what's happening in the cities, let's think about what documentation and what things we have that could reflect what individuals are doing in teams. So when I started out doing this work, I started looking at the electronic health record. And I started looking at, was there anything that could be gleaned from using the electronic health record for something other than billing? And so this represents the first paper that I ever wrote in this sort of space, and this idea of how could we use the electronic health record to assess resident assessment. And it was really interesting because a lot of people saw opportunities. So like this one resident said, you know, your supervisor can say to you, I noticed that you always order antibiotics for three weeks instead of five days. Maybe we should go over the dosing regimens or frequency regimens for antibiotics. So this idea of when we're doing things is a way for faculty to provide oversight and feedback that is directly related to the work that you're doing. There were people that were also supportive of this, but a little bit hesitant, and they highlighted the things that the EHR just cannot capture. And so like this resident said, I can see the utility because it seems very objective. It just doesn't tell the full picture. It doesn't capture how long I spent at a patient's bedside talking to her about the possibility that her baby might be born severely premature. I cannot think of a mechanism of capturing that in the EHR in a meaningful way. So again, this idea, people were very worried early on that the EHR was going to be used for surveillance and be the only sort of measure of assessment. And they were like, there's things that are good about it, but there's also things that it's not capturing. And we need to think of it as just another tool in our toolbox. And then this is really interesting. This comment came from a, a surgeon faculty member. Um, and this is really what triggered a lot of the thinking around interdependence, he said, you know, my patients, their complication rates should be my complication rate, not my residents' complication rate. I'm watching them like a hawk, and if I think they're going to make a mistake, we take over. Because of my patients, I consider them to be my outcomes, not my residents' outcomes. So this has also really um, interesting implications for how we would go about using the HR for residents specifically. Because if you use the logic in the clinical space that the attending is the one that is you know, the most responsible person and has to, you know, it doesn't matter what happens, it's under your watch, whether or not we believe that and whether or not that's fully really accurate, um, people can sort of get behind that logic. It's a lot harder to do that with a resident because they are not the last line. They are just one team member. So how do we capture the work that they're doing? And so what we did was we, from the ground up, we said, okay, we're going to take one specialty and we're going to ask folks, what do we want from the electronic health record? If we could do this, and we could do this well, what would you want to know about your performance? And this is the list that the participants came up with. And it's really interesting, I'll know, you know what is here, but also what isn't here is things that are more tabloids. So, you know, would you care about that? So they say, yes, that's a measure that we you know, always use, but honestly, it's not a measure that we care about because people often can be very sick, we've got high rates of people that die, so like, if we really want to have a measure that's going to be meaningful and help me to change my practice as a resident, that's probably not the one. The other thing that we did when we did this study was we asked folks, you know, to just come up with some of these measures. Some of them are the part of traditional quality measures that we think of, but others were the late and mean. And, and we asked them, how much do you think that represents? Like, you know, put it, on a, put it on a spectrum for us. And so we ended up characterizing this as sort of like independent performance and interdependent performance. Even though we asked people with this along the spectrum, they dichotomized it. They were like, I'm responsible for that, not responsible. Here's all the five reasons why I'm not responsible for that. Um, and so it's interesting because something like when they say when a patient comes through um, whatever service they're on, 100% um, of the participants said, like, you can't attribute that to me. Like, I'm so relieved. Like, there's a lot of people going to that first 
versus um, the metric of turnaround time between when you sign up for a patient and you place that first order on a lot of residents said, like, yeah, that tells me how long it takes for me to see the patient, do my history, do my physical, um, and then figure out what my next steps are going to be. So what's interesting in all of this is that this idea of how independent or independent you are in the clinical environment really seem to depend or lie behind the beholder, right? So often um, people would say, oh, if you look at order, that seems like the easiest thing that the orders are in the EMR, we can track that. Well, if you look at that sort of in the middle there, this is where we get into the sort of middle. Anything to do with ordering is some people say, yeah, that's all me, and others will say, no, it's not me. And so that's really where there's like an opportunity for us to, to learn more. And so what we did is we took these metrics and then we went into the, into the CERN database and pulled all of these data for residents in, in one residency program. And we gave them pretty little workers and we said, we'd like some of you to, well, we'd like all of you, but we're hoping at least some of you will participate in this study. And so out of the 21 residents in the program, we had eight residents that said, yeah, I'll do your study. And so what the study consisted of was having a report card, viewing it, but then sitting down with a faculty member that we had that we had trained and they were going to push them through interpreting these DHR data. And so what was your, and then, sorry, I should say, we followed that up with individual interviews both on the faculty side and on the on the resident side. But one of the things that was very surprising about this was in every single interview, didn't matter whether you were faculty, didn't matter whether you were a resident, people talked about the objective nature of EHR data. I mean, over and over again, heard people say, this is just so incredible, this is valid, this is reliable, this is like so good in terms of capturing what I'm doing compared, you know, and I can use this with the quality of comments and feedback that, that I get. And so this idea that we have a new assessment that is allowing us to capture something that residents and faculty felt were not already being captured with one of our other assessments would be really interesting and really cool. And we weren't under any sort of delusion that like, it was perfect and you know we can have that conversation on the side of how perfect some of these EHR data are. But um, the fact that people had that perception was really interesting and also was very powerful. And so, you know, a bit of a cautionary tale there in terms of not squandering this, this valuable resource. So I want to give you an example of one of these metrics. So one of them that we used was time to fluids. Um, we had time to fluids, time to antibiotics, but this was time to fluids. And within the report card, we labeled the metric as like, this is an interdependent metric. And then we explained what it was and Part of why um, this is a good metric is because we also have some clinical guidance that just says, you know, when patients receive fluids within 60 minutes, outcomes tend to be better. And then what we did was we had to create a metric so that we could measure resident performance by block. Because prior to this, when we were using it for faculty, it didn't matter. You know, you just take how many patients and faculty were found on. But anybody who knows, you know, studies of residents, they're here two weeks. Here four weeks that we went around. Um, so we had to break down our block and we took every patient that that resident had that had sepsis. And then we looked at the proportion of them that had received fluids. And then this is the interesting call here where we said, look at how many times the fluids were started by another team member. So really highlighting uh, four counties for that, the fact that they were not normal in clinical care. And then we turned around and gave them their time to fluids, right? So this was our attempt to, our first pass at trying to have people understand and capture the differences of people, other people on the team. And what was interesting is that um, most of the residents were really surprised by these clinical data um, and commented on at least one metric that there was something different. And so, as this resident said, I was, I started trying to compare things between the years, and I was kind of startled by some of the things that I thought I did better. And so the faculty coach said, you know, tell me about that. And the resident responded, well, I feel like my decision to antibiotic time is better than what is reported here. So this idea of what like, residents were actually leading some insight from just understanding their clinical practice as it's portrayed in the electronic health record. 
And then it was interesting because when I asked the question, I'm like, well, are you going to do anything different like, as a result of this? Um, when I was responded, first and foremost, I'm going to be more diligent about who is an antibiotics. I'm pretty much at the baseline on that front. I'm going to do that, which is making sure that it's prompt and going and the nurses are aware of the importance of it. Because sometimes we take that for granted that the nurses know how important some of these interventions are as much as we do. And most of the time we do, but sometimes it helps reminding them that or see to it that it gets done yourself because ultimately it's the doc's responsibility. That not just really fascinating because when I started it, uh, people would be like, oh, it wasn't me. Like think back to that other quote of like, you know, it doesn't capture my performance. And yet when presented with these data and when they reflected on the data, they're like, actually, you know, I have some responsibility on this. And ultimately, um, you know, this is my responsibility. So that's really nice to see. And so from doing all of that EHR work, we also have been pushing forward the idea conceptually and theoretically of interdependence. And in our first paper, we described that as patterns of interactions between individuals working collaboratively that can afford or constrain one's performance and potentially shape uh, the practice of the broader healthcare team. And we've gone on and done you know, really a lot of work in this area to understand what this looks like, how it manifests, how we should you know, be capturing this. And so one of the things that we came up with and, and discovered is that interdependence is not just between individuals, it can be you know, between non-material things as well. So things like medical directives and technology and organizational structures can influence, you know, they can go on back to our definition and <coughs> even more constrain the performance of an individual. So, um, we would hear things like, you know, I would want to do this, but, you know, like Trauma 99 gets called that training the association, it doesn't matter what I want to do, you know, there are protocols and things in place to do that. Um, the other thing that we discovered is that often there is interdependence with patients, which is something that we really, you know, we'll talk about patients that you care, and we'll talk about, you know, shared decision making and things like that, but um, less was being spoken about in terms of how the individual members of the team are interdependent with the patients. And you know, some really good examples of that are among um, children with chronic disease. I'm telling you, as a mom, you know, if your child is sick or something, nobody knows more about that than the parent, right? And they'll tell you who to see in each service and who to contact when things aren't going well. Um, and so that's something that was really been underexplored in terms of our assessments for a while. And more recently, this is some work from uh, two of my fellows at the University of Washington. Uh, we started to look at interdependence, not just how it exists and manifests within teams, within a single specialty, but also what it looks like across teams. So, you know, being in emergency medicine, um, we were looking at sort of conflict and what happens when you know, the emergency physician <coughs> Admitted to medicine, and medicine believes that that patient should not come to medicine, and what happens there, and the actions and the decisions that people do that enable or constrain one from being able to have that patient move through the system in a way that they think is appropriate. And over time, we've really come to discover that this idea of interdependence is not so straightforward. In our early days, we talked about this as interdependence just you know, sort of being a thing, a unidimensional or a real construct. And so where some of it, where we started to shift our thinking is in some of our more recent interviews where we would hear things like, yeah, the structure of our care delivery is that residents rarely have the final say on anything. Unlike elsewhere in the hospital, we have residents, we have senior residents that we call fellows, and then there's a consultant. So the residents rarely get to do anything on their own. And then even the same interview, they would say things like, I would say that our senior residents have, you know, in many circumstances, near complete autonomy. So this idea of they can do things by themselves, they can make all these decisions, but then not really. And we also talked about interdependence, at least for a as being this linear trajectory. When you're entering into residency, when you enter into training, you're more interdependent, also because of necessity, right? You don't know things, you're looking to others to sort of help you to learn. Um, and then as you go through a residency, you become more independent, right? So here's a quote from, from 
one of our participants in our most recent round of interviews where they said, you know, some of her in her career would probably rely heavily on a more interdependent process and feel more comfortable having inputs from various people versus I think somebody a bit further on in their career who might be more clinically experienced and more confident in their skills, maybe more apt to rely less on interdependence. And then the cost, but not necessarily, right? <laughs> That could also make them more likely to seek the input of an individual who has a bit more experience in that area. And so this led, you know, like I said, in our initial work, we had this spectrum and we're like, wait a second, maybe we need to circle back. And so that's what we've done in our most recent work is we've come to recognize that interdependence is probably not this unidimensional construct. It's not this thing. Um, but rather, there's different facets of it. And we talked about there being now two types of interdependence. So there's the supportive interdependence, which is an interaction between team members that's triggered by one member's um, incident expertise to perform in their scope of practice. So as you can imagine, a lot of the examples were a trainee who didn't know something and needed an attending or someone to, um, to help them. But it wasn't always just trainee examples. You know, we heard things about faculty skill decay and other situations where um, individuals felt that they needed to come in and provide some support. And that's contrasted with this other type of interdependence that we're calling collaborative interdependence, where it's not actually related to the experience of expertise within an individual scope of practice, but rather this recognition that patient care requires contributions from other team members. So a classic example that I'll use from the PD is a trauma situation. <coughs> Often we'll say, well, we need to see the resident, you know, do the ordering. We need to see the resident doing this, doing that, doing this. We actually don't, right? We, we need to know because in those moments, we need to be efficient, time is of the essence. You know, being able to say to the pharmacist, what meds do we need here? Okay, good, go. Being able to say to the nurse, put that in, being able to say to the tech, are you ready to, you know, um, to switch, and things like that is actually what the job is, is actually the thing that we should be measuring, not whether they knew what medications to order, because with enough time and under different conditions, you know, they we would want to know that, and presumably we would already know that, but under certain conditions in which care is provided, this is actually a necessity. So I want to talk to you a little bit about some of our current work that we're doing and um, work that's in process. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit more conceptually and I'm happy to off camera with you um, a little bit more of the details if you're, if you're interested. But for the second phase of study, what we ended up doing was we created these videos to specifically depict this supportive and collaborative interdependence that we had discovered. And what we did was filmed these things, presenting all of these little clips, all of the things that residents do, all of the things that attendants do, all of the things that um, allied health professionals do, but it's often not captured when you look at like an OSCE video or some other assessment where we're saying, okay, here's the, here's the part. Um, so, you know, the conversations with the nurse where, you know, you've got your, your information, but then the patient has told the nurse something that potentially might change the patient. Um, the back and forth between the residents who are like updating the attending, all the consult calls, like we represented those in these scenarios and, and we depicted those. And we asked individuals to complete the survey and we said for each clip we asked them to describe, you know, did you see interdependence first off? Um, and then if you saw it, what kind of interdependence did you see? Was it supportive? Was it collaborative? Or did you see both? Because we were done in scenarios where we were doing both. And then we asked them um, for each, each video that they saw to give an EPA rating. And at the end of seeing all three videos, we asked them to give a milestone rating. And so this is really interesting. We did this in two specialties. We did this in emergency medicine and in pediatrics. We wanted to capture the inpatient and the outpatient experiences. And so when we answer, like when we had depicted supportive independence, 96.8% of, of the ratings said that there was some form of interdependence there. Um, many folks said supportive, they were saying supportive, or people would say both. So 
if you're using kind of a partial credit model, you either got it right or you were sort of like half right. In pediatrics, though, we have a bit of a different story, right? The case depicted was supported in independence, and 94.4% of the time, um, they were able to identify some form of interdependence, but it wasn't always supportive for that along with that collaborative. So this gave us some insights into understanding how um, individuals within the team setting, in that inpatient setting, where you're doing more rounding, you're doing more um, collaborative work together compared to the sort of EP setting where you can sometimes do the dividing talker. And we did, we did the same thing for collaborative were less able to identify interdependence compared to supportive, but, um, but when they did, they were typically bang on. So it wasn't you know, collaborative when they saw supportive, it was collaborative when they tended to see collaborative. And that held true for both emergency medicine and pediatrics. So the other thing that we wondered in all of this was can participants describe interdependence, right? Because we thought, okay, are they just, in these instances when they're not getting it correct, do they do they even know what they're looking for? And so we looked at the comments that went along with the answers. So if someone said supportive, their justification for why they said supportive was correct. So they knew what they were looking at. So we wanted to understand this is a, just, you can't understand this, or you're not seeing this, or are you seeing it, but you're interpreting it differently. And so for supportive, we, you know, we get comments like, well, there's an inability or lack of expertise in designing this complex discharge plan versus collaborative, where they'd say the president appropriately utilizes social work expertise to figure out safe and slow information. And so we followed some of this up as well because I remember since we you know, I've always my whole life been interested in variants. Um, and where does this come in from, right? And when we did follow up interviews and we talked to folks, they would, they would say things like, well, that's not in their scope of practice. And then someone else would say, well, that is in their scope of practice. So it became very clear that even in um, emergency medicine and pediatrics, where they have pretty well defined it because both in Canada and the US, it still wasn't clear you know, on these um, collaborative sort of activities who was responsible for what. I mean, I mean largely it varies from so I was going to summarize that, you know, participants can identify interdependence and they can accurately describe these two types, but they really struggle to distinguish this element, which has implications for our assessment. We can't just turn around and give a form to faculty and say, go do this and expect to get out of all the data. So there's still a little bit more work for us to be done there. Although there is this like validity evidence that we're starting to build towards this concept. And when we looked at the EPAs and milestones, what we actually found was that interdependence was not really related to those things. So it is likely capturing something that we're not capturing in our other already existing assessments. So taking all of this and, um, and going back, I, I shared with you my journey how I started in the EHR. And you know, when you're, when you're trying to solve a difficult problem, you tend to go back to what you know. So I've now gone back to the EHR, but in a slightly different way. And so this here is, um, is one of my current fellows, in school small at um, NYU, and I co mentored him with my colleague, Jesse Berger Bell. And what we've done uh, recently is we've gotten audit log data, so EHR audit log data, from the Epic Secure Chats. And we've been looking and we've been mapping out who's talking to who on these teams, right? And figuring out what are the patterns of how people are interacting with one another in this, in this space. And what's really interesting about this is we've broken it down by roles, we've broken it down by gender, we've broken all of these different um, you know, patterns down to understand what's happening, who's sending these messages, who's reading these messages, because of that we secure chat just because somebody's sending it doesn't mean they're actually the person on the other side that's reading them. But what this work has really allowed us to do is identify, you know, before we have something in the EHR and we wanted to look at like who is attached to a patient, whose name is on the chart, and things like that. Um, there would be a lot of names and a lot of people because anybody who's doing any kind of interaction would be there. But what we've been able 
to do with these seven secure chats is isolate what we're calling the primary team, the two or three people that are really taking care of this patient. And we've been able to see patterns. We um, took a particular condition, so in this case it was um, just heart failure. And we've been mapping out the messages. So at admission, uh, who's talking, who's sending the most messages, right through to discharge. And we've been doing it by day. And this has been really interesting because um, we've been running a bunch of social network analyses to sort of understand the relationships, who's responding to whom, and so forth. And one of the issues that we've run into was this, you know, um, multicollinearity, basically, of when you're looking at uh, length of stay, it's, it's related to everything else. So what we've done is we've run these social network analyses by day. So like your social network analysis for day one, for day two, day three, day four. This accounts for the fact that some people get admitted on day one, and then also we get to leave the hospital the same day. But every time the team changes, we've created a new network. And then what we've done is superimpose those networks on one another. So um, as I was describing this, it's kind of like taking a stamp and if you know, you push that stamp right on the same spot where it's happening, it becomes darker, right? And so in places where the team stays constant and the team stays the same, you're going to see those sort of darker lines. And when there's a change, we can actually see that with the network. So we've created this superimposed network to be able to sort of capture who's talking to who and who's working with one another as it is <coughs> individual patients. Um, the other thing that I've done recently is you know, connected through a colleague of mine to um, this uh, pediatric critical care uh, physician actually at Stanford. And I said, you know, I'm interested in these crazy ideas around interdependence and how we can measure that. And he's like, well, I'm interested in the HR stuff. You know, let's, let's team up and, and just work together. So we did. So we've written a whole grant. And one of the, the one that we're currently working on now is validating some of these data. It's amazing how when, you know, you talk about the HRP, the people who listen to the HR must be right. <laughs> we actually don't know that. <laughs> so um, we spent the last several months um, in the thinking, collecting, you know, through direct observations, and you know, that sounds like we're a great helper with that, going in and figuring out what people are actually doing and just watching and documenting. And so um, we're really quite excited to, to see, um, you know, the validation of this because we, where we're going with this is trying to understand um, people's patterns and people's behavior as it pertains to the HR. So I'm going to give you an example here. Um, one of our clients is looking at prescribing errors. And so we're looking at the individual team and system level. So at the individual level, you know, um, one of the, if there's an adverse safety event, one of the things that could happen is you could self correct, you know, oh, I mean, that thing. She you know, all of these, um, you know, charts of I just ordered this, but on the wrong patient, or, you know, wrong bills, and you catch it yourself and you just self correct. So that's an individual, if you didn't need the team to do that, it wasn't the system, but you were able to make that correction on your own. Um, there's other ones where you order things, and then, you know, the pharmacist or the nurse or someone else says, Are you sure you want to do that? Are you sure you want to do that, Jones? So that's what we're calling sort of that team correction. And then within all of our medical systems, we just have these administrative guardrails of like, you know, we need, <laughs> we need more information before we're going to let you have that. And so being able to look at these at different levels, what's been interesting, why the validation is so important on this work, is because we actually can see patterns. So if you're the type of individual and you make, you know, mistake in your ordering, you're likely making the same mistake over and over. You're not making different mistakes, you're making the same mistakes, which is kind of interesting because now what we're getting at is we're getting at this imprint, we're getting at this sort of phenotype of like what you're bringing to the team, and there's so much power and so much importance in how you can use that in our management policy going forward. And taking this back to education, what I think is super fascinating about this is actually being able to map out throughout the course of one's residency all the different imprints that would come from all the different faculty members that a resident works with. And we know that you know the patterns in the sand will be different for each resident of the program. So really getting at this idea of this precision education and understanding 
um, what the affordance is to have work with this person over this person. And so I mentioned before, you know, when I came, I probably had 12, 13, 14 slides about basketball, and I was really trying to keep it to a minimum, but I just can't help myself, you know, we were a basketball family, and so I was last year at um, Madison Square Garden, and um, really surprised to see they have a new advanced statistic. And like I said, we can talk about what goes into that advanced statistic later. But it's called a player impact estimate. And what it does is it's a measure to gauge an individual's contributions, basically, to all the different plays that happen throughout the game and every, um, and every play that they're a part of, right? And so I really take into the idea that I really think this is where we're going in the future. We don't need player impact estimates, but I really think we could have these provider impact estimates. And that would be you know, a measure of a provider's overall contributions to the team. So every patient that they touch, we can take some of that information and then sort of estimate what their overall contribution would be to the team. And the beauty of this, too, is that it can be used to assess any member of a healthcare team and capture these aspects of really great teams. Because every individual has these unique set of skills and perspectives that they bring to the team. And the strength of these teams lie in providers' individual contributions as well as their cooperation and synergy. And so I love this quote, um, you know, especially when I live in Toronto, but even now that I don't live in Toronto, this is from uh, Donna in Suits, where there's, um, there's an episode where somebody, they're trying to figure out if they should get rid of, they need to do some layoffs, and uh, this person was told to like, figure out who to lay off, and she goes, so I have an algorithm, and I'm just going to let the algorithm decide, you know, who's most valuable and who's least valuable. Um, and what ended up happening was there was an individual that everybody instinctively and intuitively knew was valuable, but never came out top on the metrics. And so she said, you know, the thing, the thing that you have yet to realize is that there are players who never put up great stats, but we keep them around because they make the people around them better. And right now, we are not capturing that in healthcare. We are not capturing the people that make others around them better. And so that's where I think all this research is kind of cool and interesting because we can, we can actually start to get towards that moving forward. So with that, I'm going to leave you.
think just your last comment, you said that was a character in suits? Yeah. Okay, okay. So, um, yes, I'm getting the context. But now I am curious as to whether in a healthcare setting, people are aware of the, the glue that keeps you together, right? So, um, going back to some work that Jeff had done years ago around expert diagnosticians, they have gone to different centers and asked people to nominate, like, who is the doctor that you go to? Like, who did all the doctors go to? Because they always know the answer, right? And that's the expert, and then they went. The goal was to understand, like, what made that person like that. Um, and so I'm thinking in my mind, if you went to any center and you said, like, who is the best whatever, who's the best surgeon, who's the best ex, those names would come to mind easily. I am really curious as to whether people are actually consciously aware of the people that are the blue, because often they are in the background, right? They don't uh, leave that in the act on as notably. Yeah, so I have two comments on that. The first one being, um, and I think we've done it in Missouri, but there's, um, there's a special issue in academic medicine around precision education. I encourage people to look at that. It's a bunch of a series of papers in there that are really interesting and really push me boundaries of this. Um, but in one of the studies that we did, we used mixed methodology and have identified, going back through our data, that there are people who are aware. So it's not even always a person, but a group of people. So they will say things like, you know, I belong with this group. Like, I belong with these folks, right? And what's really interesting of how that came about is um, at least at Western, residents get to self-select, like, for the they get into residency. So, like, I remember talking to this faculty member, and he was like, I never get a PGY-5 resident. I'm always with a junior. <laughs> and knowing, like, okay, like, the interpretations of that. But there were some people who always had a PGY-5 resident that people always wanted to work with. And when I said, you know, what was that about? They love the emergency department well, they're very efficient. The things that would help prepare them for that lead to attending. So that was really interesting. Um, and then I have another comment about uh, talking to the expert as well. Oh, um, it was really fascinating. So when we're talking to residents in this the last round of volunteer interviews that where the support and collaborative interdependence came from, I think it's also important to know that. Some of that glue and some of that um, you know, special sauce that, that is happening, part of what we're not capturing is, is because it's not always clinical. So I hear stories from residents of like, um, you know, the reason we couldn't discharge this patient was because they were on domicile and they had broken their glasses and they couldn't leave the department because they couldn't see. And the resident was the one running around trying to figure out how they could get our glasses for this patient, right? We don't have an EPA for, you know, gets glasses for a patient, right? But that, if you look at discharge, which is really what that was around, is that problem, you know, there's a lot of invisible work, especially that residents and trainees are doing, and that's really what in these videos we we're trying to depend on, like, you know, it's not as easy as, like, Hey Jonathan, I'm just gonna like admit this patient, right? You know, I gotta show you the five phone calls of back and forth, you know, where I call medicine and they say no, and they say call cardiology, and then I call cardiology and they say no. Like, this is the reality of the healthcare system that we're working in, and we're just not capturing that. So figuring out, you know, how we can how we can identify those things that allow care to move forward. You know? Some trepidation, I have to admit. <coughs> you should not pick easy topics, do you? <laughs> well, so I say uh, it's easy, you know, and what you're doing here, right? You know, it would have been done already. So this is, this is so, changing it up. <laughs> that, that was the precursor. Um, it's important what you're doing because it's essentially identifying the domains, the low side, where these activities take place. But I think it's important to remember that there's I think to pick up when we first discussed it, it's important to remember that there could be a total mismatch between the quantity of something and the quality of something. As yet, you have any new we have to be done to identify what is a good supportive relationship versus a bad supportive relationship is, and how to quantify those things. At that point, we're probably talking about the new Prioritize like what is the most exciting thing. 
um, in all of the collaborative work that I do, you know, working with folks, I am always bringing that measurement and assessment lens into it. I haven't lost that. That was my contribution. So, you know, sometimes when you do this quality work, they're like, this is interesting. I'm like, yes, but we're going to use this to measure. <laughs> like, you know, this is where we're going back to. Um, and we know that one of the challenges we've experienced is a lot of this differentiation, and we're just not getting the ends to your comment of, like, how do we how do we define some of this stuff when like, we just don't have the number of encounters? Um, so one of the things that I'm really excited about is this idea of the fact that faculty are actually quite stable. So if you think of like your two studies, you know, that we grew early on and been doing, right? We look at those variants everywhere. Looking at these metadata, looking at the audio data, looking at in the EHR, we can actually see the faculty are quite stable. And so we can use that from a measurement perspective to our advantage because we can now hold that as a constant. And in terms of your um, description of like how do we know whether it's better or worse, is this going back to like did this resident, was this resident, you know, adding or you know um, subtracting in terms of your number of stay based on what we know you likely would have done if nobody else was there. So very cool. Just for profound um, shows that these things actually carry with you. 
individuals are certified? What have your conversations been with certifying bodies about this potential change? Um, is it threatening? Is it welcoming? Have you had those conversations? What does that look like? Because it disrupts our system when we start to say, here is how we can see how an individual performs within the team, but care for a patient is not predicated on this false assumption that it's a one to one correlation with the provider or the patient, but it's much more of a collective effort. Well, it's interesting. So we have all this data out there, you know, program directors say, you know, this is the percentage of patient, or this is the percentage of residents that are allowed to take care of my family. This is the percentage you know, residents that you know, I would trust to take care of people, I would like to go to stats. Um, and I think, you know, you have some of this where like, this individual will be fine if they're at a place like Stanford where you've got a ton of resources and everything like that. This person is gonna like trash and burn in the community, right? Because they just don't even know. Um, so in terms of like, you know, I've got my client with Sky Dream, but yes, I've been talking to them and I, I don't know, maybe hope this doesn't come across as like too sadistic, but I'm actually kind of excited for the first time in a while, like the regulators are scared. Like this is a real thing. Um, they have no idea or ways forward. Um, they've been used to just doing assessment the way that it's always been done. And it's just not sufficient. <coughs> it's not sufficient that we don't have the answer to change it yet. And so being able to provide them with something, like I don't think we're ever going to move into like team certification. More actually that advocate that we should last point of like there's individual contributions but then there's also the team and the system and things like that. Um, but having a way that we can sort of account for, you know, this is the this is what we observe, this is what we need to do as an individual under these conditions, you know, and to be able to provide people a way forward so that they can capture um, this is what this person looks like within the team, right? So if you think back to like baseball and things like that, you know, we know bringing somebody in Everybody can't be the wrong on the court, you know, that's just not how sports works, right? You know, um, you need to have some of those other people. And wouldn't it be great from a hiring standpoint, you know, you've got you know, our department chair, you've got you know, our chief of staff to be able to be like, we need this right now. We need somebody who has these skills and can work in this sort of environment. And that's where I think, you know, going forward, it's really exciting because I think we need to at least do that. Please join me in thanking Dr. Sima. Sorry.
Department of Pathology and Molecular Medicine, and, uh, and we'll be conducting a study called the FOAL study, F-O-A-L, uh, and that acronym breaks down to Feature Optimization for Anatomy Learning. And the objective of the work is to evaluate the relationship between proximity and key views with learning nominal anatomy, such that evidence-based pedagogical decisions regarding teaching methods and resources employed can be optimized for novice students. So a quick one for Danielle one more time. And our second winner is uh, Renata Kalki, who's right here. And Renata is with the Department of Medicine and is a scientist in Merit. And um, the title of her work is When the White Coat Only Comes in One Size, an Intersectional Qualitative Study of Anti-Fat Bias in Medical Education. The project team aims to challenge the taboo of fatness or obesity in medicine and medical education, not only shedding light on the experiences of learners and doctors identifying as fat or obese, but also advancing understanding about an overlooked aspect of intersectional discrimination in medicine and medical education. So, thank you. Uh, if you have the opportunity to attend the session in 2036 this morning that was the Merit Fellows, the Faculty Fellows, um, and we're also going to announce the Faculty Fellows for the coming year uh, at this time. Um, the Merit Faculty Fellowship um, it's sort of an intensive, comprehensive um, mentorship and supervision process in health professions education offered at Merit. Um, the fellows come in and they develop a year-long tailored experience with us in conducting high-quality education research. Um, they partner with an educational scientist and, uh, and they get supervision and mentorship and, and we bring them along and then you get to see great presentations like you saw, uh, saw today. Um, our previous fellows include Catherine Tong, who might be in, in here, Gregory Spadoni, and I think I saw Quang Yo somewhere. Uh, well, maybe they've all gone. <laughs> um, but really happy at the list of uh, fellows that we have this year because they're both graduates of the Health Science Education Graduate Program. So again, it's really wonderful to see how your experience in our graduate training program continues and takes folks on uh, to new and deeper scholarship. Um, the first is uh, Allison Sohenwald. Allison, are you here? <laughs> Allison is the Department of Pediatrics and the Masters of Science in Child Life and Pediatric Psychosocial Care. We look forward to working with you. Thank you. Right on. And we also, uh, Desi Reddy. Is Desi in the room? No, let's give him a round of applause. <laughs> Supervising Desi and HSCD and his scholarly paperwork, and he's with the Department of Anesthesia, so we look forward to welcoming him um, in the coming year in Merit, which is awesome. And we have one more uh, bit of business. Um, a key award uh, that we like to give out every year is the Health Professions Educator uh, of the Year Award. Um, it's not of the year, it's a career award. Um, the award is designed to encourage and reward the continued excellence of health professions education and scholarship within the McMaster University community. Um, the nominees are, uh, are always senior established faculty who are leaders in their educational departments um, that have a body of work that supports the nomination. Um, you know, and it can include teaching, mentorship, scholarship, innovation, uh, and leadership in, in this space. Um, and, and this year's uh, uh, winner, um, received a very compelling nomination signed by over 30 trainees uh, who, who endorsed this application. It was really quite wonderful to see. So um, I'm, I'm going to invite her up here in a second, but I'm going to talk while I do it. So uh, our winner this year is Dr. Suzanne Archie. And <laughs> Dr. Archie is a professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Neurosciences and a psychiatrist at the East Region Mental Health Clinic. She is the Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Director for the Postgraduate Medical Education Program here at McMaster University, and is the chair of the Anti-Black Racism Task Force for the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. She has published on different aspects of early intervention, including substance abuse, program evaluation, and ethnic diversity in pathways to care for, for 
for a first episode of psychosis. Her research has been supported by CIHR, the Peter Boris Center for Cannabis Research, and the Mental Health Commission of Canada. Currently, Dr. Archie is engaged in knowledge translation projects involving video game technology to educate youth about cannabis and psychosis, particularly those from black, African, and, community, and Caribbean communities. She is conducting a program evaluation of an education module designed to advance the mental health of black children and youth. And, and I know that she's a, a, a big mentor to a lot of the scientists and scholars in our community uh, all the time. So I'm going to stop talking and I'm going to let Suzanne say a few words. Would you like the microphone or do you think you got it? Uh, no. Can you hear me? Yeah, all right. Thank you so much. I, I would really like to thank uh, Jonathan Trevano and the Merit Selection Committee for thinking of me and for uh, selecting me. It's quite a prestigious honor. I'm very humbled and I'm very honored to uh, receive this award. Um, there has been tremendous interest in supporting equity uh, research and education here at McMaster, and uh, I feel that I've been very privileged as I did my undergraduate medical training. I did my undergraduate undergraduate training here in uh, psychology. And then I did my undergraduate medical school program here. And then I did my psychiatry resident here. So it's wonderful to receive this award, uh, having spent my whole career at uh, McMaster. And um, I would like to thank uh, Angeli Menezes, who is uh, the director of the McMaster Racialized uh, uh, Mentorship Program, uh, for her support nomination, as well as the community of practice uh, that's associated with the Master Racialized uh, Program. Albina Beltman, who is the Associate Chair of EDI and IR in the department, and also Nick Cates, who was the former chair of our department. I think that I have learned so much from all the students that I've had the pleasure of working with through the years that the students really, uh, and that was demonstrated again here, they are the headwinds. They are taking the whole EI and IR um, movement forward and are teaching uh, you know, faculty how to do it. So I'm very happy to be part of that process. And um, I'd like to thank, obviously, my team of researchers and advisory council, and finally, my husband and my family for their unwavering love and support. So, thank you. So, we're just going to, we're going to close up a, a few bits of a housekeeping. Um, we're going to save the turtles if we can, so please uh, recycle your uh, name tags, so collect them outside. And, and we're not quite done with thank yous yet. Uh, a tremendous amount of work goes into putting on a day like today. Uh, it doesn't just happen. Uh, if it felt like it just happened, that means because people have done it now, getting into this. So, uh, we've got, and I know they did come in here, so they're all tucked around here, but I know they're all going to come out. Uh, a round of applause for Samantha and Courtney.